Welcome to the Stonebridge Press Podcast. I'm your host, the publisher, Peter Goodman. I'm here in Berkeley, California. And on the other side of the continent is Michael Palmer in Brooklyn, and also today's guest in Pittsburgh, Meg Taylor. We'll be talking with Meg. Uh, she is the managing editor of Monkey, New Rain from Japan, which is a literary magazine based in Pittsburgh, at least in the United States it is. And it's easily findable online at monkeymagazine.org. Meg edits Japanese literature and translation, uh, art books, exhibition catalogs. And like me, she is actually an ex-editor of English language books in Tokyo. We are both these days very, very far from our original starting places, both uh, far in time and far in distance, but we're still nevertheless engaged in one of our very first loves, which is literature from Japan in translation, and that is kind of what Monkey is all about. I should also mention that Stonebridge Press is the very proud publisher of books under the Monkey imprint, and these are novels in translation. Two of them have come out so far. We have another coming out uh, this spring, and then more to come beyond that. But first, hi, Meg. Hi, Peter. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So let's talk about Monkey. What is uh, what is Monkey all about? I said it's a literary magazine. That doesn't mean it's a collection of stories and poems and stuff from writing workshops in Iowa or places like that. And uh, especially the burning question is why Monkey and not Tanuki, for example. <laughs> right. Well, we started off as a magazine, and we were monkey business for seven years. We were a magazine at that time with an ISSN, and then we recreated ourselves in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, as a an annual anthology. So we are now a book with an ISBN. We've dropped the ISSN, and we still are referred to as a magazine, and that's delightful. And but uh, we want to stay in bookstores for much longer than they keep magazines. That's one of the reasons we switched over. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely definitely has sort of a, uh, a what the Japanese used to call a, a mook look about it. It's sort of a, yeah. a magazine, but it's perfect bound. It's large, full color, full color. Uh, yeah. Lots of pages and only twenty bucks. So right. Uh, right. And you can find it in bookstores, and you can also get it from the monkey website right so what kind of uh what kind of work is work is in monkey well we do everything from um short stories is the main thing i would say but we also do graphic narratives uh which are very popular kind of, a kind of manga but very very uh literary manga if i could describe it that way sure and uh poetry essays a little bit of nonfiction. As well, well I, I'm sure there's a uh, a ton of that stuff floating around. And how do you decide what goes in the magazine? Are you looking for a particular aesthetic or particular sensibility? Well, we're very closely tied to a Monkey, which is our sort of mothership in Tokyo. So that is a magazine, and the editor and founder of that, Motoyuki Shibata, is the editor and founder of. Our monkey, monkey new writing from Japan. So we draw heavily from those issues. And uh, the the monkey in Japan is a is also a literary magazine. Which yes, it is a literary magazine, and most of the writers that we work with publish first in monkey, and then we select. Mostly, it's Moto and Ted Goosen who select from those issues of of the Japanese monkey, and then we commission translations. And and that is, of course, one of the big differences, because in uh, the Japanese monkey, you don't need the translations, but the monkey in English is obviously in English, so it's all about translation. And Yes, but actually the Japanese monkey is is also very much about translation in that they feature American writers, British oh. writers, translated into Japanese, and many of the writers that are published Japanese writers that are published in Monkey, in the Japanese Monkey, and also published in our Monkey, are translators themselves. So Moto, the founder and editor of the Japanese Monkey and of Monkey New Writing from Japan, is the translator for everything from Paul Auster and Richard Powers to classics such as Huck Finn huh. and Gulliver's Travels. So, so, so is it fair to say uh, that Monkey is as much about literature as, as it is about translation on both sides of the Pacific? On both sides of the Pacific. I 
Of course, I knew that, but until we spoke about it just now, I didn't see it so clearly. But yes, we're all of us are excited on both sides of the Pacific with translation. I see. So not not simply literature as an art, but translation. Yes, absolutely. As an art. Mm-hmm. And where where do you where do you find these translators? Some of them are former students of Motos and Ted's. There, it's a fairly small community, and there are established translators like Ted Goose and Jay Rubin. Royal Tyler, who is in his 80s now. I mean, we've right. worked, we work with all of them. Right now, we're working with three generations, is the way we see it, of translators. And it's very exciting. As an editor, I suppose that, that's kind of exciting, too. I, you know, la- language evolves, and the approach to translation evolves as well. Do you, uh, not, not to promote any kind of ageist rant or, or anything like that, but do you, do you see any, uh, any difference in the, uh, say the styles of of English of say more the more elderly translator versus the <laughs> more elderly younger up and coming. Um, it, no, it's more about the person, frankly. You know, Jay Rubin is one of Haruki Murakami's translators, as is Ted. They have, I would say, slightly different styles in English, but they both are marvelous translators of that writer of that you know of Haruki. I guess I haven't really answered your question, have I? Yeah, I'm just kind of curious because I, I'm. I, I guess I'm kind of mindful of in, in the publishing world these days. There's a lot that's changing, and there's a lot of things that are driving the industry that maybe have nothing to do with the writing process itself. It has more to do with tastes among readers, attention span, how books are made available, and especially how books are produced. There's a big push, for example, to uh, to digital publishing, which be, because the, the, the unit cost of man, manufacturing issues, big books are a lot more expensive yes. than they used to be to produce, which kind of forces publishers, maybe without even knowing it, to, to kind of look for, for shorter books or to break long books into into. Into pieces, you know? And that may be one of the reasons that Japanese literature is doing so well right now, because we have these wonderful little books, the, like the Dragon Palace that we just published with you. Right, right. It's, it's eight short stories. It was only, how many pages is it, Peter? I forget, but it's a, it's a small thing. I think it's 168 or So it's a like beautiful little book. And um, People are not, well, yes, some people are still buying Barbara Kingsolver, you know, blockbuster novels. But a lo- increasingly, I think, especially among young people, you would think, oh, they're reading on their, you know, they're reading digital. But actually, a lot of young people are loving these little books and really the huge attraction to fiction and translation right now among young people so that, I'm, that I'm seeing. I hope that we reap the benefits, Peter. With Dragon Palace. <laughs> well, that, 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 is the, that is the hope for sure. Yes. You, you probably hear more from readers than, than we do. What what kind of things are people generally responding to? And are you, is one of your goals to challenge readers' uh, perceptions of either Japan or Japanese literature or Japanese writing? Well, yes, but not consciously. Uh, we, we really want people, we, we're very playful. We want people to enjoy Japanese literature. That we want to to lure them in with all sorts of yummy stuff and interesting stuff and and curious stuff. You know, yes, absolutely, I agree with you that we do have that as an underlying aim. We do want to expand the notion of what Japanese literature is, but what we're doing very overtly is entertaining. I know that the number of translations being published every year is slowly increasing, yes, and uh, yes. certain uh, certain Japanese authors have have really developed a strong fan base beyond Murakami, which is the yes, first person yes. that everyone everyone always thinks of. There's a lot of other writers who are actually very uh, successful in their appeal to to foreign audiences. Of course, I'm always you know as a publisher, you're kind of looking to. It's always a, a roll of the dice and you're saying, well, this is going to succeed because X, Y, and Z, or this is not going to succeed because A, B, and C. It's it's very hard. We're, we're kind of looking for trends and themes and yes. things we can rely on. What about uh, what about you folks? Are, are you seeing any kind of 
general trends or interests in among the readers? Well, I think the the rise of of the women women writers is significant. The designated heir, so to speak, for for Haruki Murakami is Miyako Kawakami. And, you know, she has the big trilogy out, Breasts and Eggs and Heaven and All the Lovers of All the Lovers in the Night, I think is the third one. Anyway, they're doing quite well, Europa editions. And there are many more, but we're very lucky um, with the monkey imprint with Stonebridge Press to be publishing Hiromi Kawakami's Dragon Palace because these are stories from 20 years ago that the big publishers, you know, are publishing her latest novel, that sort of thing. Whereas we can come from the side, so it's not from behind, but from the side, and say, oh, look at these early, really, really weird stories that she wrote. You know, you you might like all of these novels that are out there, but look at these. And People from My Neighborhood, which was published by Granta two years ago, again, Hiromi Kawakami, equally weird stuff. So we tend, Monkey tends to be more interested in, and I think our monkey fans tend to be more interested in the weirder stuff, <laughs> to put it, <laughs> you know. Uh, is, it, is, that, is that a literary <laughs> term of art? <laughs> the weird, well, no, but I think everyone understands, you know, the, 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 the magical, the, the you know, transformation, this sort of thing. Takaoka's Travels, the next novel we're publishing with you, is, is full of transformation and shape-shifting and that sort of thing. That does seem to be a, uh, I don't know if that's a, a, a monkey theme or, or what, but that does, this this kind of Japanese, for lack of a better term, magical realism seems, you know, seems to come from a different place. Say, yes. Something like Mar- Marquez does, because you have this whole kind of Shinto animus background in, in Japan, uh, a real sense that the, the natural world is infused with spirits. And ancestors. Yes. yes, and people still believe that. And so they do. So if you look at the Dragon Palace stories, we have someone falling in love with her 400 year old ancestor. We have direct references to folk tales. It's just, it's such a rich culture that these writers like Hiromi Kawakami, but she's not the only one, are able to draw. That's definitely prevalent in uh, the Thorn Pillar, also. Oh know, yes, tons, I mean, and noted references. That's true. That's absolutely true. And there, you know, you have a, a writer who is known primarily in Japan as a poet, and that writing is very loose. So, Peter, going back to your question, we also want to expand the idea of. Uh, what literature is actually there's very rarely a clear resolution in Jap in the, at the end of a story or novel in Japanese literature, and and isn't that a wonderful thing? And isn't that much more human? Isn't that a more human story with only partial resolution? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it requires readers to kind of re- readjust their expectations of mm-hmm. what you know how how stories are going to end. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of genre fiction in Japan too. That is translated lots of mysteries, oh, yes. science fiction, you know, conventional literature. These things that appear in Monkey are are more experimental. Yeah, yes. I, uh, yeah, yes. And we would argue more fun, <laughs> more playful, <laughs> or or weird, or, or weird, weird. Yeah, or, weird. Yeah. or weird. Well, let's talk about that uh, a little in terms of presentation because there are a lot of aspects of the stories that assume, of course, that the reader is going to be familiar with a lot of the cultural, religious, historical issues that are raised, cultural references, references to people. As an editor who is presenting this material in English, you don't want to have a lot of footnotes in the story, which are going to take take people out of the story. And on the other oh, no, hand, you no don't... footnotes. No footnotes. Yeah, no. yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, no, it's, no, a, it's a, no, definitely no, a rule no. in translated fiction. Absolutely, I mean. yeah. I mean, we occasionally use a gloss, so a very subtle, you know, the tatami mat instead of just say tatami. But but a lot of a lot of these words now uh, uh, very different from when we started, Peter. Right, right. You know, back yeah. in the seventies, a lot of these words are now in the English dictionary are widely understood. Japanese culture has really opened up. So to us, we we know so much more about it. I think you know, I'm I'm kind of stuck maybe in the old way of doing things. You're talking about glosses, I. 
I guess I consider those to be very, very important in many, in many I cases. I still use them. I still yeah, use them. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, particularly when it comes to geography, when people yes. are referring to a city. and Absolutely. You, yes. you know that when, say, if it's a reference to Akita in a novel, you're kind of referring to something distant, provincial, far north country. Right, right. Tohoku. And what is and what is Tohoku? The significance of Tohoku? The, yeah, yeah, maybe the uh, American Appalachia. You know, yes, and, right. and, and you know, how do you convey that? I've worked on some translations where you know someone comes in from the provinces and is like uh, speaking Inakapen, you know, the, the yes, you yes. Know, country dialect, yeah, and yeah. and so they will render it as if they were from you know backwoods Alabama or something, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. perhaps kind of. Kind of offensive, but it's one of those tricks, you might say, or a technique that a writer or an editor might use to convey something that's in the text without actually having to spell it out. Right, right. Well, I know that uh, Jeffrey Engels, who is a translator for The Thorn Puller, the first novel we did with you, he and Hiromi worked very close. So the author, he and the author worked very closely together. Her English is excellent. That was an unusual it's unusual for the author to to have that kind of comfort level with English. So that when Jeffrey proposed a change, something, you know, an addition to help the English reader, Hiromi could understand the necessity for that. Right. And as a courtesy, she would she'd be given the opportunity to approve those changes. Yeah. So in, in that novel, we were able to make, if you did a word for word or sentence by sentence or even paragraph by paragraph, Comparison of the original text and the English text, you would find quite a few differences. But that made the novel more uh, enjoyable in English. And it also, it made it, it's, it's, Hiromi considers Jeffrey a, almost a co-author. Ah. In, ah. in, she, you know, he's not, he's the translator, but they did, they did so many changes to transform that novel into into a much more enjoyable experience. And well, that's a that's a rare opportunity that a translator yes, has to work so rare, closely. Very uh, rare. I would assume. I mean, sometimes they, you know they do, they don't have the connection. They're hired by some New York publisher to do the translation, and right. or the um, you know the author is you know not fluent enough in English, say to to know the difference uh, as a general sense that things are changing here and there, but not. Not really, you know, you know, qualified to to say whether that's a good change or not. I know that in uh, translation contracts that we've been involved with, it, there's always a paragraph that says that the company agrees to make a a you know faithful and accurate translation of the original. And I don't think anyone takes that you know literally. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't want a literal translation. There's no, nothing no, worse. No, yes. I mean, uh, pretty, you know, particularly in fiction and and. So I think that makes the the role of the translator particularly important because it's not simply translation; it's more interpreting. It's a creative act. It really yeah, is. A yeah, creative exactly. Act. And and we're recognizing that more and more, not just the monkey imprint at Stonebridge Press, but also just generally in 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 the publishing world. So we're now not every publisher, but a lot of publishers put the the translator's name not only on the title page as has been going on for decades, but on the cover. And the translator is often part of the promotion for the book now. Right. I, I mean, Not always. Not always. But that, that's what we want to do in any Well, I, I've always thought that was, a, that was a great advantage to have a you know, translator who, who loves the material and is able to express their enthusiasm for it to the public. I mean, particularly if the author is, say, not fluent in English and lives in Japan, or in many cases is dead. So uh, yes, yes, is, as is the case with our next novels. Yeah, so I mean, we you know, a lot of the the companies, uh, the big publishers that are publishing Japanese fiction, they don't necessarily have anyone who is culturally fluent or language fluent. So they rely heavily on information they get from the from the translator. So I mean, ha having the translator on your side is extremely important. Yes. I think we're the only publisher who works so closely with the translators. And, you know, the older translators who had never been worked so closely with <clears throat> in the past were a little bit, it took them a little time to adjust. 
but everyone enjoys it in the end. So, for example, Moto will do a very close check against the original. There are revisions at that stage. And then I step in and do a lot of back and forth with each of the translators. So volume four is just yes. about to launch in. Yes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. So it has launched in Japan two weeks ago at Kinokuniya, the main Kinokuniya. And in we're, we're in mid-October, Tokyo. by the way. Yes. Yes. It has already launched in Japan. It is going to be published here November in November 14th. Every every issue has a theme. This year it is music. During the pandemic, let me just backtrack to 2020 and 2021. Those were the dark days of the pandemic. And so we did food for the first year. That was when everyone was learning to bake bread and very much focused on food and staying healthy. And then the second year was travel. A very few people could travel, but we were all longing to travel. And last year, it was what we called crossings. We were crossing over from the pandemic into the sort of unknown territory. And now we're celebrating. We're celebrating with the music issue. We talk about in the, in the last section, if going back to some questions about translation, we asked the translator what role music played in their translation process. And that was a particularly interesting uh, response to this. How, year. how, how so? Oh, well, some of them listen to music and different types of music inspire them as they translate. Other uh, translators like Polly Barton works in total silence. She finds it too distracting. Some translators spoke about music and the cadence of the language and how they try to convey that in the translate in the English translation. Very different languages. How do you transform? How do you take the cadence? that you experience in one and transform it into, into this very different language, uh, the challenges of that. So Great. Okay. So if, if any of you want to check out Volume 4, it will be available in mid-November from your local bookshops. You can buy, buy it on Amazon, and you can also get it from Monkey. And if you go to Monkey, you can buy it as an EPUB or as a PDF. So, you know, it's a substantial, weighty volume if you don't want to uh, hold around, just put it on your phone. Yeah. Oh, one more thing to, to mention. As of this year, all of the monkeys coming out starting this year, but actually I, I went back to 2022 and did that one as well. They're all accessible to, to screen readers. So all of the images, if you can't see the images, uh, they will be described for you. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, you can also buy uh, backlists of uh, yes. old, old monkey business. Yes, monkey uh, business. Issues there too. Yeah, yeah. It's a, actually, it's a, it's a really fascinating website because, as Meg was saying, the, it has all section devoted to the translators. So you get the bios of all the translators. And, you know, I noticed that they all had birth years. Yes, yes, we did. That's a very Japanese thing, but we retained it because we want people to see the different generations of translators working. You see, we have, we have people who were born in uh, 1980, 1981, 82, and people who were born in the 40s, all working together. It's very exciting. There are many young translators, so um, the future is secure, right? Lots of good oh, stuff I think, think so. And, <laughs> yeah. and on the website, we also have a section, Translators to Watch For, where we profile up-and-coming translators and give, give you a sample of their work. Some of them, we did this quite a few years ago. We started that, and now they are very well established, like David Boyd and, and, and Polly Barton. Others, like Laurel Taylor, really are very young, up-and-coming. So look for that section if you go to the website. Oh, one of the things I wanted to mention, Meg, is that um, we have a forthcoming monkey imprint title called Takoka's Travels, written by Tatsuhiko Shibusawa, a very interesting, eccentric Japanese author, uh, sadly deceased, and translated by David Boyd. And one of the nice things about this book is that it was it received the uh, subvention from the Sibley Award, which is, comes out of the University of Chicago. We're very proud to get that to support publication. But why don't you tell us a little bit about Takoka's Travels? Takok's Travels is a is a fantasy set in the ninth century, and it features a um, a prince who's become a Buddhist monk. He's in his sixties, and he has always wanted to go to India in, in search of Buddhist truth, in search of the Dharma. So he and his little entourage, his companions, set off from China, from a port in southern China, 
sort of the magic and mystery begins. Uh, there are storms, there are strange encounters in, in Southeast Asia, there are mysterious characters that appear and disappear. There is a scene reminiscent of, of Pirates of the Caribbean, but in fact, Shibusawa wrote this, you know, before Pirates of the Caribbean was invented in Disney World. And I will not give the end away. But it is, but the prince does succeed in finding a sort of enlightenment. And there is some resolution. But as Peter and I were talking about before, there isn't the kind of resolution that you would find in Western literature. It is a transformation and it will take you on the most marvelous magical mystery tour. And it definitely uh, continues the, the weird tradition uh, yes, that Monkey yes, is known for. Yes. Right. Well, well, to go back to the um, to the author, he was the translator of the Marquis de Sade. He wrote uh, essays about the occult. This is where he's what what he's bringing to right, his right. own fiction. So th this is a, an, another book that probably defies people's expectations of what Japanese, Japanese literature, literature is like. Definitely an adventure and a lot of fun. Where did the translation come from? I mean, sorry, where did the project come from and why do you think that it's important? Oh, that's that's a great, thank you for asking that, Michael. So this novel has a sort of cult status in Japan, similar to The Master and Margarita by Bulgakov here in the West. Hardcore literary sort of cool cats. I think this is the cat's meow. Many translators have wanted to translate this. David Boyd has dedicated himself to translating this for, he said he started in graduate school. So that was, I would say, maybe 15 years ago. He mentioned it to Moto, who was his teacher in, that is Motoyuki Shibata, who was his teacher at the time in Tokyo. And last night we were exchanging emails and Moto said, I can remember David as a graduate student saying that this is, you know, we're just passionate about this novel. So it's been a long time coming. It's a passion project. So Takaoka's Travels is coming out on May the 14th. We're very excited about it. Great. Well, it was, uh, so we've been talking with Meg Taylor from Monkey, new writing from Japan. And you can find out a lot more about Monkey. You can buy copies. You can find out about translators, forthcoming books, etc. at monkeymagazine.org. And if you're interested in the Monkey imprint itself, there are uh, several titles available now from Stonebridge Press. There will be links on the Monkey website, or you can go to stonebridge.com and explore more there. Thank you very much, Meg. It's been great talking to you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for listening. To find out more about Stonebridge Press and our books and authors, go to www.stonebridge.com. You can find our substack, The Stone Bridge, at stonebridgepress.substack.com. And you can visit and message us on Twitter at, at Stonebridge Pub or on Facebook at Stonebridge Press. To reach us by regular email, write to us at spp at stonebridge.com. <laughs>